Let me uh, introduce myself. I'm Ramiro Prudencio. I'm the CEO and President of Burson Marsteller in Latin America. Um, with me on stage is Craig Smith. He is a principal at Penchon Berlin, or PSB, a leading research uh, and political consultancy. He has over 25 years experience managing political campaigns at the local, state, and national levels, and several presidential and parliamentary campaigns done overseas. In the 1990s, Craig was part of uh, the White House uh, as assistant to the president and political director in the Clinton administration, responsible for the Clinton administration's national political strategy. He also served as campaign director and senior advisor to the presidential campaign of Senator Joe Lieberman of Connecticut. Um, Craig is a recovering attorney. Uh, we have another one on the panel. I'll introduce him shortly, which is Don Baer. Um, and living proof that the politics of Arkansas is applicable just about anywhere in the world, right? You'll talk about that. Um, on the phone with us is uh, Christina Pearson and Don Baer. Christina is Senior Director of Public Relations at Microsoft. She's based in Washington, D.C. and has the responsibility of leading Microsoft's public relations efforts in the area of public affairs and government relations. Prior to joining Microsoft, Christina was Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the Department of Health and Human Services from 2001 to 2008, the length of the uh, George W. Bush administration. Um, at HHS, she oversaw the federal government's communications on health issues across a wide range of agencies, agencies as large and as important as the Food and Drug Administration and the Center for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, she oversaw the work of thousands of communications professionals. Um, and prior to joining the Bush administration, Christina had a career on Capitol Hill. Uh, she also worked at the American Hospital Association and at Fleischman Hillard. She joins us today from Washington, D.C. via conference call. And uh, finally, Don Baer, who is worldwide president and CEO of Burson Marsteller and chairman of Pension Berlin. He's also the co-founder and chairman of Palisades Media Ventures. Um, prior to joining Burson, Don was senior executive vice president for strategy and development at Discovery Communications, or Discovery Channels, uh, the world's largest nonfiction media company. And he was responsible for worldwide marketing, new ventures, acquisitions, and new media. Um, and particularly relevant to the discussion today, uh, from 1994 to 1998, Don was assistant to the President of the United States and White House Director of Strate Strategic Planning and Communications under Bill Clinton and played a very important role in the re-election effort of 1996. Uh, and prior to joining the White House, Don was a Assistant Managing Editor at US, US News and World Report and as I alluded to earlier, he uh, also is an attorney um, who practiced early in his career. In addition to his responsibilities at BM and PSB, Don is on the board of directors of PBS, the Urban Institute, and the News Literacy Project. So it's a pleasure to be uh, moderating a discussion with such a distinguished panel on a very timely topic. We are, what, six days from uh, the election. We'll touch on the presidential election, but we'll also take a step back, and that's where I'd like to begin, which is basically to talk about some of the similarities and differences um, in running communications at a uh, political campaign and at a major corporation. Um, so first let me do a quick sound check. Don, Christina, can you hear me and are you on the line? Yes, good morning. Uh, yeah. Great. Both, both here in Washington. I do want to say, uh, Miro, first thanks to uh, you and to Craig for being there in person. I know Christina and I both wish we could be there. Uh, uh, we had two other participants who were going to join us who were in New York. One of them is Kevin Cheeky uh, from Bloomberg, who I think is actually helping to hold down the fort big time in New York City. And the other, uh, Gary Coops, who's our global uh, uh, media practice chair. Gary lives below 34th Street in Manhattan, where I'm told all power, all power is out at this point. So uh, uh, we're, we're glad we were able to assemble people and to do this. And, and, and Ramiro, I wanted to say one thing. One lesson we know for sure about similarities between uh, communications and politics and communications in and, and, and the corporate setting is that stuff happens. Uh, and stuff has happened here in the Northeast, and uh, uh, that's why we're not there in person, but we wish we could be. Great. Well, thank you, Don. Uh, Don, I'd like to start with you and uh, just have a sort of a broad question, which is, 
uh, in your experience, what have been the most applicable and relevant lessons from the campaign trail to the, uh, to the corporate boardroom or to the function of corporate communications? Uh, well, one I would say, that, and I don't mean this to sound slip, uh, is that there's no substitute for just working really hard. Uh, and I learned how to work the hardest I ever worked uh, in my life when I was working in the Clinton White House with Craig and others. Uh, and certainly just uh, sheer diligence uh, uh, makes a huge difference in the corporate communications uh, setting in the boardroom, as we all know. But I actually think beyond that, uh, something I learned uh, when I was in politics, and, you know, I came to the political setting uh, from having been a journalist covering it, but not actually in the middle of it. So I had a, a big on-the-job learning curve. Uh, but the biggest lesson that I, I find does apply uh, completely in the corporate setting is the critical importance of establishing a narrative. Uh, a storyline about what, in this, in that case, your campaign or your presidency is about, and being able to use uh, the policies and the positions that you're taking, uh, or sometimes the things that you're doing in opposition uh, to other candidates, uh, to use those, if you will, as proof points uh, to to basically demonstrate that narrative and to keep it uh, moving forward uh, constantly, and to be uh, constantly reminding your audiences. Uh, of what that narrative is and how those proof points are making uh, making it real. And in my experience uh, in, in the corporate setting, both uh, in-house, as it were, at Discovery Communication, uh, and then certainly at Pearson Marsteller working with uh, many different corporate clients, uh, it is the, the presence of narrative and having a sense of the theory of the case, of, of what you're trying to communicate and indeed what you're doing as, a, as an enterprise, that that's very important. And when it's not there... Uh, when it is vague or flimsy, uh, as it can be both politically as well as in the corporate setting, uh, that's when you get very big problems in terms of what outside perceptions are and, and what the reputation is for all kinds of different uh, audiences. So to me, that's, that's the most important lesson of all. Christina, how about your, your, uh, your learnings from both uh, politics and now from a senior position at Microsoft? Don mentioned that establishing a clear and strong narrative to sort of survive the buffeting of, of external events. Um, is that what you have found both in, uh, in government as well as outside of government? I think that's very true. I think it's important to have that strong narrative, but I think you also, uh, one thing that we learned so much in politics is that you have to make it personally relevant and you have to make it local. And so in, in doing that narrative, uh, when we seek to communicate it to customers or to targeted other targeted audiences, we really need to do everything we can to take it to the places where people live, work, and play. And we need to be careful uh, to always uh, you try to make it uh, relevant to the community that we're talking to, uh, and then also quite frankly keep repeating it over and over again. Uh, and I think that that has been uh, an incredibly important part. Um, I know in my campaign days, you know, we spent tons of time, you know, going over maps and, and trying to make sure that we, you know, really talk to certain areas of the country that maybe perhaps weren't hearing our messages. And so I think it's that constant reevaluation process and constantly repeating that narrative, repeating it in a way that's personally relevant and finding new ways to do it uh, that are personal and also impactful. Craig? Yeah, I agree with what uh, Christina said. I think <clears throat> one of the things that's important is message discipline. Um, you know, voters, when they vote, they use long-term memory. They use what they remember. And to get something converted to long-term memory, scientists say you have to hear it seven times. Well, c assuming that the average voter listens, you know, spends about three minutes a day thinking about politics, to get them to hear something seven times, you have to say it 700 times. I mean, you have to be very disciplined to get your message to break through to voters. You've got to say the same thing over and over and over again. Now, that's something that, that I think is relevant in, in your work. I think it's actually a lesson that politicians can learn from corporations. You know, I, I remember when Bill Clinton first started running for president, he wanted to give three different speeches on three different topics all on the same day. You know, it just, it, it, you know, it just becomes mush to voters. I mean, you've got to figure out exactly what you want to say, and you've got to say it over and over and over and over and over again in order to break through to voters because, you know, 
whether it's a product or whether it's a candidate, you know, people don't, you know, they have busy lives. They don't spend a lot of time thinking about what you're selling, whether it be an individual or an idea or a product. So um, you drew a, uh, a similarity there, but let me, let me go a little further. And Christina, let me ask you, um, are CEOs, the, is it fair to say that CEOs are political candidates? Um, if we apply the political model to the boardroom, can we run into problems as well because those two positions or those two roles are, are different? What are the similarities and what are the differences for, for CEOs? Well, I, I think that you need to have the constant level of preparation and um, and information, and it's sort of a never-ending, a, a bit of a never-ending campaign when you work with uh, senior leaders at a corporation, and you need to. Uh, it's a campaign that doesn't end. You you keep going constantly. Um, and reevaluating and moving and having your um, having awareness of what your what your market's feeling and, and, and adjusting and also um, having that push and pull internally to, to make sure that you're communicating the right messages. Don, we had earlier talked about um, that campaigns today uh, are bleed into the period of governing. Uh, because of the very partisan political environment in the United States. Um, and CEOs uh, manage on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, having to communicate very strongly as well, uh, feeling the pressure of Wall Street and other constituencies. Tell us a little bit about how you would advise, how, how, what, what's the similarity and the difference of, of how you would advise a CEO or a political candidate to, to uh, fulfill their role? Well, there are a lot of similarities. And I think those similarities have become more um, pronounced in the last decade to 15 years. Uh, as, we, as we all know, we have kind of entered more the cult of the CEO, or at least the focus on CEOs uh, as the visible leadership increasingly of, of major corporations. Um, uh, so there are good big similarities. And I think that uh, part of what both a major candidate or a, a, an office holder uh, needs to do uh, that is very similar to a CEO is to be able to articulate uh, a vision for what he or she uh, intends the purpose uh, of, of their tenure, if you will, to be, uh, and to be pretty uh, both aspirational about that purpose but also to be always concrete and realistic about it, practical about it as well. And it's balancing those two uh, that, that's very important. And honestly, I think it's probably as important in the uh, political uh, situation to be find that balance between the aspirational and the practical as much as it certainly is in the business world. Um, clearly, in the business world, uh, there are different metrics uh, that uh, leaders are held against than, um, than is true in the political context. Uh, uh, the bottom line, uh, quarterly uh, report, uh, the ability essentially to move the P&L and, and to be successful uh, financially and as a business person. Uh, 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 but there are also the, 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 all the issues about being able to uh, move their, their, their own workforce uh, in, a, in a shared direction to be able to clearly articulate that. Uh, and so many of the, many of the communication uh, uh, requirements are very similar. I do think there are differences, too, uh, beyond just uh, kind of the, the economic differences or purposes. Um, and and it, I think some of these similarities can be overstated at times. Um, uh, so, you know, some of, those, some of those differences, frankly, are uh, when we're talking about a political candidate, for sure, and even when we're talking about an office holder, we're off, often very zero focused on that individual, uh, not on an apparatus. I mean, political reporters cover the campaign, you know, not on uh, uh, all the whole, the whole team that is behind this person. But I think when you're talking about a business, uh, it really is more of a team and an enterprise-wide uh, set of considerations, and that some CEOs uh, at their peril get out ahead of that and, and try to uh, personalize uh, leadership perhaps more than is wise at times, rather than uh, being clear that, that there are a whole lot of people 
and a whole lot of processes that are involved in making uh, them successful. Well, Don, it's interesting. You touch on the issue of how a corporation and a political campaign are, are different in that way. Craig, earlier you were saying that political campaigns have a very big challenge and that they go basically from being uh, having a P&L of zero to a P&L of several hundred million dollars, sometimes in just a few weeks. Um, and the bulk of that is spent on communication. So yeah. tell us a little bit about yeah, that it's, process. It's one of the biggest differences I see between between what we do in the political world and, and the corporate world. I mean, when you think about it, <clears throat> you go from non-existence to a billion dollar corporation with 200 satellite offices and, and you know, 10,000 employees back to zero all within a two year window. So everything is very compressed. You know, your messaging, your branding, all of that stuff has to be done in a very short time frame. Every hour, every minute is critical. So in the political world, one of the things we have to do is, you know, if you get attacked at 10 o'clock in the morning, you better have a response by noon. Now, that doesn't mean in the corporate world you don't have to respond, but I think the time pressures are somewhat off. I'm a big believer in every time somebody attacks you, you have to have a response. You know, people... If, if somebody says your product is bad or your company is bad and you don't respond, people will say, well, I guess it was true. So you have to push back on all of those attacks. The different, so that, I think, is the same, whether it's in the PR world or whether it's in the political world. The difference is the time pressure. You, know, you, you get to be more thoughtful in the corporate world than you get to be in the political world. Christina, you had some thoughts on that earlier today when we spoke about the need, wh how convenient, how necessary was rapid response in the political context versus the corporate context. Do you want to share your thoughts? Well, sure. It, it's important in both, but I, I do want to pick up on something that, that Craig's saying here, which is that, you know, in the political world, if, if something was said, you know, at 10 a.m., you had to have a response by noon, and I, I, totally, I totally want to second that. I would also say, though, that you know, and especially within the last couple of years, I would say that Windows even for, for many politicians that's down to an hour or less because with Twitter you have to it's, it's expected to be instantaneous and the whole news cycle on some on some level has formed its narrative within a you know, very short time period after something has gone out. And so while I agree that the political pressures are higher to uh, to respond even faster. I do think that those are lessons for the corporate world. I think that there is um, a compressed time frame due to social media um, that, that continues to get even tighter. I think that, um, but I think that the thing about it, though, is that um, corporations, one mistake I have seen, what I saw perhaps more when I was uh, in the private sector, was that you know, corporations wouldn't respond to misinformation. And I think that's something that is a principle of political engagement that is very good to apply. Um, you know, con making sure that when there is misinformation out there or, some, or mischaracterization, that there is some type of response that you can point to. Um, because these things do live for so long online uh, and in people's memories. And so being quick in your response, but also making sure even when something um, is a characterization that you disagree with, not maybe it's a, a shade of gray, that you, that you make sure that you put your point of view out there uh, in the form of a blog, in a speech, in an interview, but somehow get it out there and uh, to keep repeating it to make sure it's out there in the public consciousness. Well, Christina, yeah, you raised uh, the issue of social media. No, no, the only thing Go I ahead. would add uh, to Craig's uh, uh, differences is, is uh, you know, in the corporate context, uh, you learn very quickly that uh, it's a pretty unforgiving marketplace, and especially when you're dealing with uh, financial communication, stock price, and the like. Uh, it's pretty important that you have to move very fast. So the, the tools and techniques that, that one learns in uh, crisis communications in the political setting uh, tend to be very applicable uh, in, in the corporate setting, uh, including one that Craig might speak to, uh, it, later on, which is the role of research, uh, both research, research that you would have done far enough in advance so that you have a pretty decent sense about how things are going to play and, and how to respond, but also what one might do with, with uh, so-called flash research. 
that enables uh, very quick decision making um, around this. Yeah, well, those are, those are two issues I'd like to explore. Research and social media. Christina r raised the issue of social media and Twitter specifically, but re uh, and Don raises research. Craig, tell us a little bit about how research is used in the political area and what's applicable to the corporate yeah, it world. Yeah, it is. You know, I've spent most of my life in politics. I've worked on campaigns since I was 12 years old. And the one thing that I think campaigns do better than the corporate world is they use research. You know, research, you know, no, campaigns don't make a move without polling it, focus grouping it, testing it. And they learn how to develop messages from research. You know, now some people say, oh, here's a poll. We're doing good. We're doing bad. That's, you know, the least helpful question in any poll is, if the election is held today, who would you vote for? Because the election's not being held today. Now, it all gets all the headlines. It's always the number one story in the news, but it has absolutely no ap applicability. It's not valuable to a campaign. What's valuable to a campaign is to figure out who you're trying to talk to and what messages <coughs> move those people. And it's something that campaigns do much better, I believe, than corporations or public relations. You know, 90% of the time in a campaign, there is a right answer. And research will tell you what the right answer is. Now, 10% of the time, you just have to wing it. But I think often in the PR world, people wing it, you know, based on my experience having, having moved from the political side into the kind of corporate side. In the, in the corporate side, people just kind of wing it. Oh, I think this is a good idea. Let's try this. Okay, that's kind of risky. You know, if you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars, you want to know what the right answer is, and 90% of the time there is a right answer. And I think campaigns do a much better job of that than corporations do. And, and they do it very quickly. Yes. You know, we do, you know, they do overnight polls. You know, they do a debate, and they know the next day what ads to put up. They've analyzed it. They've tested messages. They've cr done creative. they tested the creative online. You know, and they know the next day what ad's going to work with whichever group needs to be moved that night. Don, does the corporate world have to move at that speed? Uh, it often does. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Christina can certainly tell you there are uh, countless crises uh, in situations that arise where you do have to move at that speed. Um, and in my experience, uh, corporations uh, now today are doing a better job at being able to integrate research, both long-term insights, but, but also uh, near-term uh, imperatives, uh, much better than they, than they used to. Some of that is because uh, people like us and others of you there uh, in the audience today who have uh, broad evidence-based communications to bear in, in the corporate setting. Uh, it, uh, so they do have to move quickly. And they also need the value of the research that really helps them to frame what I was talking about originally, which is the narrative. Uh, those things should not be whims or just sort of fingers to the wind. They should be based on uh, longer-term objectives that are, that are tested against the various audiences and, and, and targets that you're trying to accomplish things with over time. Um, let me just make an, uh, or ask you to start thinking of questions because we're going to open up to Q&A in about six, six or seven minutes. So if you have any questions, please think about them because uh, we, we will be taking them. Um, Christina, you had mentioned Twitter. Can you expand a little bit more beyond Twitter just to, across social media channels? Political campaigns, I think, adopted these tools earlier, more aggressively, and to some degree, I think, more effectively than the corporate world. Um, what is the corporate world learning about how political campaigns have used social media? Um, and what do you think they're, uh, they're uh, incorporating into their corporate communications activities? Well, I think that um, it, it's become its own form of conversation that you have to engage in. And I think that you, you ignore social media to your peril, um, whether that is in the form of blogging or Twitter. Um, and also not being necessarily out there and, and, and embracing the next um, the next wave of, of what's next. And so I, I think it's a, a, a constant conversation that you need to engage in. And also think of new ways of uh, of using it. And I actually would here would would draw on um, my experience from the HHS world, which was 
um, we spent an awful lot of time uh, after uh, natural disasters such as Katrina really spending a lot of time talking about how we would communicate in, in a crisis. And if, you know, if we, we had gotten to the point where we had relied so much on uh, our website and our blog, but we realized after Katrina that you know, people wouldn't have those things. And so you know, we spent a lot more time talking about new ways of, of reaching people that we hadn't spent, invested as much in before. Texting became a lot more important in the public health world and CDC and others. Um, and so I think that, uh, I think there's a constant process of reevaluating, um, depending on circumstances and learning from that and reevaluating social media and, and realizing just because I have a website, it doesn't stop there. You have to have a constant process of reevaluating how you're using it. And also if it's the best circumstance to make sure that you're, that you're getting out there when you need to. Greg, anything on social media? Yeah. You know, I did a campaign. I've done campaigns in about 40 countries, and we did a campaign in Albania. And the initial research indicated that the average age of the person who's going to vote was 28 years old. Um, and anybody over the age of 40 had already made up their mind. So we, this was a mayor's race, and we ran almost the entire campaign on social media. It was all done on Facebook. Because one of the things we found in the initial research of the country was that Albania, for some reason, has a very high usage of Facebook among young people. So we did Facebook town halls, all of our messaging. We didn't issue paper press releases to the press. If we wanted to issue a press statement, it went out only on Facebook. So the reporters had to go to Facebook to get our messaging. Uh, you know, we did a lot of their overseas, not in the United States so much, and overseas text messaging is a huge campaign thing. You know, we had the prime minister send out a uh, text message to everybody in the country. You know, I'm running again. Tell me what's wrong in your neighborhood. Okay, you know, he got like, you know, 100,000 people texting back. My street light's out. You know, I need a job. My cousin this, my cousin that. And every day we had him go out and he would, you know, his staff would go through whatever he got that day and he would respond to one of them and try to fix that problem. We made a press thing out of it. So here is a little country like Albania that the use of social media in campaigns there is way ahead of where we are in this country. You know, and it's just, you know, two-thirds of what we do in the U.S. is applicable everywhere and one-third is not. You know, each country is different. You know, the key is finding out what the one-third is, because in each country it will be somewhat different. But there, you know, social media was a huge determining factor, much, much more so than here. Great. Uh, so the current campaign season, we have a national election going on in the United States. So, Don, let me turn to you. Um, what is there to be learned uh, from the Obama campaign? What is there to be learned from the Romney campaign? Um, as to how they are executing, um, and what lessons might there be for, uh, particularly for, for corporate communicators? Well, uh, let me say on a positive note about both of them, I guess this is a positive. Each campaign has done a lot of work to target messages very precisely to uh, targeted uh, audiences. Uh, and to be pretty uh, clear and focused, can you all still hear me, on um, uh, 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 you know, who they're trying to reach and what they're trying to reach them with. I would say on a more critical basis, uh, it's surprising to me that two campaigns uh, representing two people who have been, if you will, in the business of public side marketing for a long time, because both of these candidates have been and both have demonstrated real capability in this respect over time uh, in different uh, sectors, that they've done such a bad job of uh, presenting a consistent uh, image of themselves and to be able to drive it uh, persistently over time, um, uh, really this point of narrative, which I think has been seriously lacking in both campaigns. And I think, I think the, the sort of nature of the campaign and where it is at this point reflects that pretty well. So um, those are kind of two lessons that I would say on, on the, uh, that's especially true, I would say, on the uh, side of President Obama's campaign, on, 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 on the side of Governor Romney's campaign, I'm, I'm surprised 
uh, that, that a campaign and even a candidate who probably has had as much experience with marketing as they have had and understanding political communication allowed so much time to go by in the early stages of the uh, campaign between the two of them, which would have been early this, uh, late spring and early summer, allowing uh, images to be portrayed relentlessly by the Obama campaign that the Romney campaign did very little to try to mute, uh, especially around the main capital uh, side of things, uh, which I think are probably having an impact even today. So um, those are my observations at, at the moment. Christina, what have you, uh, what's been remarkable to you about these two campaigns over the last several months? Um, I, would, I would agree with Don that there were, um, especially early on, a lot of images that, um, that campaigns were defining each other as opposed to defining themselves. And uh, I think that has, um, honestly, I think that that has created um, some really lasting effects that folks are dealing with. But what's interesting to me um, you know, beyond the advertising and the social media and everything else, is that as communicators, we, these are tools that we have. But in the last days of the race, it, it is, at least according to the polls, seems to be, you know, a very close race. And part of that is because of the, I think, the debate performances. And so no matter how much we do on the, you know, rapid response or social media or advertising or research, and research does play into maybe prepared, preparing your candidate. But, you know, it also comes down to a lot of it is the person who is out there who is the person who's running. And I think that you saw uh, with Romney uh, a moment with the, with the debates where he, he really defied some of the characterization that had been made about him by um, the other campaign and other, and other candidates along. And I think that surprised some people. I think it was also a testament to a strong performance um, by a candidate, and the, the president has had strong performances in the debates as well, but Romney's, I think, surprised people. And so I think that what that goes back to is, as much as we do as communicators with these tools, we also have to keep a really strong eye on um, the strengths and the weaknesses of our own candidate or CEO or whoever our spokesperson is as a corporation, because that person in that moment, no matter how much research you have or, or advertising strength behind it, that person in that moment can define you and change the whole game. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, and this is a preliminary sense, and I'm sure after the election people will look at it, but I think it has something that's relevant for what you do. I think at the end of the day they will spend a billion dollars on television, and in my opinion, all of it was wasted. You know, it, a lot of it came from, you know, a handful of people because of our campaign finance laws. But, you know, never will have so few spent so much to have so little impact. If you look at when the polls moved, they, po they moved when Romney became the Republican nominee. It became a dead heat. They moved after the convention. And they moved after the debates. After the first debate, when Romney opened up a lead. And after the last two debates, when it started to close back up. I don't think paid advertising had any impact on this race. All those ads, that carpet bombing, you know, if you live in Florida, where, which is a swing state that we see, I think it had no impact. I, I just think it was wasted. And I think it's something that y y your industry was going to need to look at. I think people just quit believing it. It just becomes, you know, I call it wallpaper. You know, you walk into a room. Was, that was the story. The story leading up was Citizens United was going to shift the way campaigns were run, how they were funded, and therefore that there was going to be this big incursion of advertising dollars and that that somehow was going to change the dynamic. And you're saying the opposite's been the case. Yeah, I think it, it just became wallpaper. You walk into a room and there's wallpaper on the wall. Does anybody really look at it? It's there. You know, if you, if you sat there and focused on it, you would think, oh, that's nice wallpaper. But, you know, 99% of the people would walk in that room and walk back out, and you say, what was the wallpaper like? And they'd go, I don't even know. And I think that's what a lot of these political ads were. Now, I think what that may mean for political campaigns is they're going to have to do edgier advertising, you know, like some corporations do, like the beer companies do. They do you know, more interesting, more, you know, the Super Bowl ads that are kind of funny and interesting and edgy. But I think all political ads, they all look the same. And I think people just quit watching them years ago, not months ago, but years ago. 
I'd like to open it up now for questions. Uh, so if anybody would like to uh, ask a question of our panelists. Hi, Craig Bida from Cone Communications. My question follows up on your last remark. It seems like corporations have understood that tr communicating with transparency, transparency and authenticity is really what consumers are looking for. And so we're seeing a lot of really positive reactions around corporate social responsibility. On the other hand, it seems like that has been completely lost on the political realm where we're seeing a rise in the need for fact checking and just mudslinging negativity. Could, could the Panel comment on that gap where it seems like the corporations are ahead on this one, understanding that consumers are really demanding and requiring it, but from a political perspective, that's really not being paid out. Great, well, you know, one, of, one of the more interesting things about politics is if you go in a room and say, okay, first I want everybody to do a focus group and say, okay, how is everybody going to vote? And they all tell you how they're going to vote. And then you run a series of negative ads. And then you ask people, do you like those ads? Everybody in the room will say, those were terrible. I cannot believe you're running those ads. Those are just disgusting. And then you say, okay, now how are you going to vote? It changed their mind. So negative ads, people hate them, but they work. Now, I think politicians are much more willing to do that than corporations, although on occasions you see corporations actually uh, tag somebody. People always say they like positive ads, and I think a campaign has to have a mix of positive and negative. I think in this campaign we've seen very few positive ads. You know, it's all been about, you know, destroying your opponent, um, which I think the campaigns need to learn from the corporate sector that you have to have you know, people want to be for something, not just against something. And, uh, but I think in the corporate world, you, on occasion, like I say, you see, you know, the where's the beef ad. That was a funny way of running a negative. Uh, and I think that was effective. And I think you'll see a, a companies can do a little bit more of that as long as they don't do it in a mean way. Um, I also think, I, I think the uh, questioner is on to something Part of it is the nature of the work. Unfortunately, in politics, there's so much room for perception and for each individual's opinion, which is not unfortunate. That's the nature of democracy. But opinions can be formed, as we know, based on lots of information or perhaps a little information at times. And so what we have found, and it's been really true in this campaign, is each campaign taking a so-called fact, uh, but, you know, twisting it and spinning it in a certain way so that it's used to support a particular argument, usually against the other side rather than in favor of anything. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of those facts are subject to interpretation or subject to understanding that there are contextual facts that go around that fact that uh, help to kind of put it in a different light. And none of that is ever brought to the surface, uh, at least in the first blush. Whereas in the business context, um, it's harder, usually, to put lipstick on a pig. Uh, and, and certainly it's hard to do it and have it sustained for a long period of time. And I think consumers of the products and services that corporations are putting forward nowadays tend to be more sophisticated, more informed, and better, judge, better judges of what is in their best interest, in part because of what we talked about before, digital, social media, uh, forcing more transparency and giving people much, much more in the way of information to make those judgments for themselves. So um, I think that it's true that, uh, that the political context could definitely learn a lot more from, from the corporate context, not just around corporate responsibility issues, but just around uh, recognizing that your consumers are pretty smart about what's in their, their, their interest and you can't really twist things too much. Uh, to dissuade them from where they're going to go. Any other question? Good morning. For the Arkansans on the panel, I'll ask your thoughts about Razorback football and the future of that. Um, <laughs> for everyone else, I would ask. I'm as as you yeah. <laughs> for sure. We talked about niche, carving out niche markets within the demographics of a campaign. But for some of the brands that are global, how do you balance the geographic and demographic differences between some of the groups and avoiding alienation when you're trying to segment and really come at someone with a direct message without alienating the rest of your base? So let me understand. The question is, from a political context, you're basically doing audience or voter segmentation on a national or state or local level. But when you're managing a global brand, mm -hmm. 
you got to all of a sudden deal with a demographic which runs across the entire planet. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think what you want to do there, though, is you want to narrow cast your messages. <clears throat> like, if you flip through the channels here, the Obama ads you see on TBS, which is primarily African American programming in, in primetime, are dramatically different than the Obama ads you see on Bravo, which is a, which is a more female-oriented, gay-oriented audience, which are dramatically different from the Obama ads you see on ESPN. Now... Okay, the people who are watching Bravo aren't watching ESPN, by and large. So, you know, you're narrow casting that message so you're not getting that kind of brand pollution back and forth. Now, you have to be careful how you do that, and, you, you know, that's why, that's why we all pay media buyers so much, you know. I, I want to talk to this people on this topic, and I want to talk to that person on that topic, and I want to talk to this person on this topic, and make sure they don't pollute, the messages don't get polluted across the, uh, across the channels. You know, it's kind of like Ghostbusters, you know, don't make the lines meet. So, Christina, you and bo both you and Don talked about the importance of a narrative. And Craig is talking about narrow casting. So how do you create an overarching nar narrative, which is then narrow casted into these specific audiences? Figure that one out. Carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Very careful. I mean, I think, I think it goes back to um, some of what Craig was talking about before with with research um, becomes a good, good portion of that. Um, it's also uh, involves uh, a lot of uh, getting the right stakeholders around the table internally, um, which uh, anyone who's worked in a corporation knows is, is incredibly important. Um, and it's, it's not a single person's decision. It's, it really is working with people who know their markets the best and, and getting that input. So it's sort of a personal research aspect of it. And, um, and I think it's also, um, Going to Don's point about carefully, you know, it's a lot of proactive thinking and thinking ahead and, and planning ahead. Um, you know, what so often happens is that you're defined in the moment in a crisis and you aren't able to do, have enough time to execute the research or, or, or do the intelligence gathering that you need to and you um, sort of make policy um, faster or make put a statement out there that is faster than you would, would normally have done it because of the circumstance. And so I think that that also, frankly, goes to, you know, this ongoing sequencing of, of, of research and planning. Great. Don? Well, I, I, look, the impulse is always to do the narrow test. And it's going to seem like uh, a bunch of unconnected dots uh, unless you've also done the larger narrative and figured out how those things hang together. Uh, and so it, it, it remains critically important that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And to do that, you know, requires a tremendous amount of work to make sure that these pieces fit together. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you do, everything a company does, everything a campaign does, or every audience you speak to in, in different ways will necessarily fit the overall narrative. But the balance certainly needs to be in favor of that. Otherwise, you run the risk of obliterating the sense that there's any cohesion to what you're doing. Great. Well, with that, we need to wrap up. I want to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Christina Pearson of Microsoft, Don Baer of Burson Marsteller, Craig Smith of Pension Berlin. Um, I also want to thank uh, Kevin Sheehy, I'm sorry, uh, Sheehy, who could not join us here. Uh, were it not for the storm, he would be on stage with us. Uh, Kevin directs communications at, uh, at Bloomberg. Uh, and Gary Koops, my colleague at Burson Marsteller, who is hopefully uh, good and safe in, in lower Manhattan. Um, I would also want to thank a lot of people who worked very quickly um, to make sure that we could pull this panel together, put the technology in place so that we could have Christine and Don with us today. So thank you to them. And uh, thanks for this opportunity.